Have you noticed how absolutely mystified so many of particularly the younger generation are that their ideas have consequences? That's what happens in an age of information. It becomes an age of competing ideas. An age of competing ideas becomes an age of competing authorities, which means one of the great questions that the church is going to have to answer in any and every aspect of culture is this one, who do I trust? We'll hear more from John Stone Street, president of the Colson Center for Christian Worldview, on this episode of FCCI's Pathway to Purpose podcast. Our goal through this podcast is to encourage and inspire Christian business owners, entrepreneurs, leaders just like yourself as we engage with content from the FCCI Resource Library and enjoy conversation around compelling topics with Christian business leaders. On this episode, I get to welcome Birga Alden and Tad Douglas. Hey, Ken, thanks so much for the opportunity to join in today. Thanks for having me, Ken. Thank you. Oh, it's great to have you both. And uh, Birga, coming to us from Albuquerque, New Mexico today. Thanks for coming across the country to my uh, little recording studio here in East Tennessee. And uh, it's just great to have you. And I know you've been involved with FCCI for a while as far as uh, having that uh, support system of an FCCI group that's been a part of your life. But share with us a little bit yeah. more about uh, God's calling on, on your life and where things are for you at this stage of life. Sure. Well, I'm a lifelong Albuquerque resident, and I am one of those people that just loves my community and feels very strongly that I'm called to be here to make a difference and help make this a better place for my children and hopefully one day grandchildren. So I, unless God calls me out, I hope to stay here, though I'm happy to go visit you in Tennessee one day. But um, yeah, I've been part of the FCCI network since about 2016, have had just a tremendous opportunity to meet with folks that live in the Albuquerque area that share a similar passion. I have been so privileged to be able to do life alongside them through the ups and downs, both with career and family and health. And I just really feel that I couldn't ask for a better group of folks to come around me, both in prayer and in, you know, wisdom and encouragement. So it's been a, a tremendous blessing to be part of the FCCI family. Well, we'll talk a little bit more in a minute about your podcast, but give us a little bit of a context here for Curiosity Not Judgment, this weekly podcast that you've been doing with Gary Opadal. Sure. Thanks. Yeah. Gary and I have been in cahoots for quite some time. We actually <laughs> talked about writing a book and, you know, Gary's a busy guy. And I said, okay, well, I need content from which to pull material for this book. So let's do a podcast and I'll start pulling out material. Well, the book is kind of set on the shelf, as it were, hasn't been written yet. And the podcast, though, has been going on and we're, you know, 80 plus episodes in and really enjoying the weekly conversation around that concept of how do you be curious and not come across with just instant judgment? And how does that impact the way that you do life? Uh, I've, I've listened to a few podcasts. I can't wait to uh, get into more of those because I, I love that perspective. And I'm so thankful that you guys are just teeing up those conversations to really come at life from that perspective and open up those opportunities to have conversation. Uh, it's just incredibly needed today. And, and Tad, uh, yeah, Tad coming to us from Louisville, Kentucky. Uh, recently, we've been involved with some FCCI activity there in that market, and it's been really fun to see what God is doing. And I know even there's a there's an event coming up on August 24th. I wouldn't do my due diligence as an FCCI person if I didn't mention there's an event coming up. If you're listening to this, before August 24th, and you live in the Louisville area, make sure you reach out and uh, learn more about the Top Golf event. But uh, I'll, I'll stop there, Tad, and let you share a little bit more about who you are and your, God's calling on your life. Um, late uh, 2022, I was running an organization called Christian Business Meetup in this area and had been around for about seven years. But we had kind of, I guess, lost our mojo, so to speak. We didn't really have a lot of buy-in from others. Um, and we just felt like there was more that we could do. We didn't really have the content. We didn't really have uh, what I felt like God was calling. We weren't really accomplishing God's purpose for us. Mm -hmm. And I came across FCCI and found just so much content um, that we could use uh, a lead a study group a couple of times a month that we're using some of the content, including what we're going to talk about today. Um, but we're also doing events every other month where FCCI is, is bringing in outside people who have run significant sized businesses that our local business owners and leaders can really identify with and have somebody they can look to as 
as role models and examples of, um, yes, you can run a business uh, and you can run it for Christ and you can impact your employees, your clients, your customers, your vendors, indeed the community for Christ in a very positive way. And so that attracted me to FCCI. Uh, and it's it's great to see what God is doing as uh, we come together and just fall in line with, with his intent and his plan and uh, follow hard after him. Mm-hmm. So, well, we're going to listen to uh, John Stone Street and speaking from the 2021 FCCI International Conference in Bachelor Gulch, Colorado. So let's listen to this segment, which is entitled Our Cultural Context. First of all, an age of information is an age of competing ideas. Suddenly ideas that would have never crossed your attention, would have never crossed your plate, would have never been relevant in your particular situation, suddenly becomes relevant because everyone has equal access to the same ideas all the time. Solomon said there's nothing new under the sun. That's certainly true. But everything old under the sun is being packaged and repackaged and packaged and repackaged, and it comes right to us on a daily basis. So the age of competing information is the age of competing ideas. The age of competing ideas is the age of competing authorities. You remember when you used to go to your mom or your dad and you say, hey mom, what does this mean? And she'd say, what? Go look it up. And where did, where did she mean? Where were you supposed to go look? An encyclopedia or a addiction. In other words, go look in a book. Now when your kid or grandkid comes to you and you say, look it up, what do they mean? Hey, listen, this changes everything. Listen, it, when, you, when you are raised in a book generation, and in a book-dominant culture, then you think in terms of cause and effect because you go from page one to page two, and what happened on page two leads you to page three, and what happens on page three takes you to page four. You might be like me when I was growing up and only made it to page seven, but you're still headed in a linear direction. How's that different for a generation where they've never started on page one and went to page two? They started on page Google and went anywhere. In other words, we're now living in a world that's lost in ability to actually understand the relationship between cause and effect. We don't think in linear ways. We think in networking ways. Sometimes there's some helpful things about that. But one of the great things that's lost is that ability to put actions and consequences together. You know what we say at the Colson Center? Idea, well, we weren't the first people to say this. Ideas have, you probably heard this phrase, ideas have consequences. Bad ideas have victims. Have you noticed how absolutely mystified so many of particularly the younger generation are that their ideas have consequences? That's what happens in an age of information. It becomes an age of competing ideas. An age of competing ideas becomes an age of competing authorities, which means one of the great questions that the church is going to have to answer in any and every aspect of culture is this one. Who do I trust? Who do I trust? I know we want to jump to, is this true? But we're talking to a group of people that have given up on the very notion of truth altogether because they don't find anyone trustworthy. Who do we trust? Do I trust my pastor or my peer, my parent, my professor? Or do I just forget them all and Google it? In a cultural moment like ours, Paul's prayer for the church at Philippi could not be more applicable. Do you remember what he prays at the very beginning? He prays. He says, I pray for you that your faith would abound more and more in truth and in all discernment. If there is an aspect that is missing in the cultivation of disciples in our churches right now, it is the ability to be discerning. If discernment is not front and center in our mission as pastors, as small group leaders, as business leaders discipling our workers, 
as parents and grandparents, then we are sentencing a generation to being brainwashed. And in an age of ideas like ours, there's no other way. And I want to give you one quick strategy, one quick thing that you can keep in your back pocket before we go to the second big undercurrent that has changed in our cultural moment. And that is really, if you want to develop discernment, a lot of times in a culture of so many ideas, ideas are smuggled into our hearts and our minds through the definition of words. Have you ever been in a conversation with someone else today and you realize really quickly that you're using the same vocabulary but not the same dictionary? That you say this word and they say that word. Like you say God and they say God and pretty quick you realize we don't mean the same guy. <laughs> Has that happened to anyone? I'll give you a couple words right now that, that, that are crucial in the world of ideas and in the health of our civilization. And we have not settled on a definition or a lot of times we're using one thing and the rest of the world is using another. Here's a couple of them. Love. Love is a word that is often used but rarely defined. Here's another one. Freedom. Here's another one. Truth. Truth. We think of truth and we're like, God's truth. The truth is what corresponds to reality. And we have a whole culture that thinks truth is only what's true for what? Me. So here's the question. Here's something that you can use with non-believers and believers alike, with your employees, with your children and grandchildren as well. Here, it's a very simple question. What do you mean by that? What do you mean by that? Several years ago, I was on a plane from Colorado Springs going to Atlanta, and I sat down next to this lady, and she said, what do you do? And I said, well, I work for a Christian organization here in town, and she cocked her head back at me, and she said, huh, I'm an atheist, prove me wrong. <laughs> no, we weren't even off the ground yet. <laughs> this started a, a three-hour fight. Now, I know what some of you are thinking. You can't fight on airplanes. This was... A, Back then, you could, and this woman wanted to fight. In fact, we got into it. Like, we were going at it, and, uh, and I, I love these sorts of conversations. So about 30 minutes in, I stopped, and I was like, you know, I really love these conversations, but I'm weird, and I don't want to ruin your day. Are you okay? And she's like, are you kidding? I'm having a great time. Are you okay? And I was like, yeah, all right, then. Let's do it. Back to it. <laughs> so that's what we did. We fought for three hours, and every 30 minutes, we'd stop and check on each other. Now, we had a great conversation. We really did. Because she was really passionate about what she believed. And the first thing she said to me, she said, how do you believe in God? Now, listen, I went to seminary. I paid a lot of money to be able to answer that question. <laughs> but somebody had taught me this question. I said, well, wait a minute. What do you mean by God? And you know what she said? She said, a grumpy old man with a beard in the sky who can't wait for you to do something wrong so he can strike you dead with a lightning bolt. That's what she said. And I said, lady, I don't believe in Zeus. <laughs> How often is it that we are defending ideas that we don't want to defend because we're letting definitions go assumed? In an age of competing information and in an age of competing ideas, fight for the definition of words. Fight with love, but fight, with, fight hard. G.K. Chesterton put it this way, if words aren't worth fighting for, what on earth would be? Look, anybody here who's led any group of people for any small group of time realizes how important it is to define your terms. All right, that's the first thing. Here's the second one. I'm going to call it identity after Christianity. Say, so, well, what's identity after Christianity? As Christianity has lost its hold on the wider culture, particularly the Western culture, particularly American culture, there's been a lot of casualties. Obviously, the belief in God has become a casualty. So we have a group, a, the, the, a, a rising group, a growing group in the population called the nuns. Have you heard about the nuns? Not the N-U-Ns, but the N-O-N-E's. They're the ones that on a religious affiliation survey will say none. You also have, I, I think, also the loss of an understanding of morality, where things that were once considered wrong are now considered right, and things that were once considered right are now considered wrong. But I would argue that the single greatest shift that we have seen in American culture is not a moral shift. 
Now, we have seen a moral shift. There's no question about that. But the moral shift, our chain, the cultural change in what we think is right and wrong and what we think is acceptable and who the good guys are and who the bad guys are and all of that sort of thing. I mean, listen, let's be honest. We need to put this out there. I was just talking about this uh, over dinner. Um, it's one thing to agree on what the good life is or what a healthy culture is, but then disagree on how to get there. It's another thing to disagree on what the good life and the healthy culture is. So there has been a significant moral shift in our culture. I'm not denying that at all. I'm just saying that the moral shift that we have seen in American culture is, the, is not the root, it's the fruit. It's not the cause, it's the effect. That more fundamentally than a moral shift has been a shift in who we think we are as human beings. The great challenge for the church right now is to try to communicate what Christianity is to a culture that doesn't know what it means to be human. I would ask you to go through all the cultural waves, if we use that word, the things that have been pounding on us over the last several years, the issues that are uh, technology, uh, what do we do with too many glowing rectangles in our life, to the, all the letters of the ever-growing acronym LGBTQIA, and it keeps going as more and more uh, different identities are added. And as we try to make sense of our racial past and our racial, racially divided pre pre present, we how to try to figure out you know, this idea of, of fashion and, and what's the role of commerce and how do we help people that are impoverished and all of those questions. I mean, we can just go down one cultural wave to another, to another, to another, and at the root of every single one of them is an assumption. Who are we as human beings? What gives us value? Who are we? And if we don't know who we are, we will not know what to do. So just great to hear John uh, deliver those incredible truths as he talked about ideas that have consequences. He mentioned that, you know, of course, bad ideas have victims, but he, he kind of teed up this idea that the church really needs to provide the answer of who do I trust? And coming back to the fact that if, if it's not going to come from the church, where is it going to come from? But obviously the church has been eroded in its uh, trustworthiness in, in recent years, of course, through the decades it has, and, and we, we fight against that. So in the idea of, of how do we really build that trust and build those bridges of connection, and what does it look like to create that opportunity for leaders to provide guidance for those or maybe who are kind of wrapped up and tangled up in these bad ideas and just aren't quite sure how to navigate a healthy, balanced approach to life? When we listened to this um, uh, podcast a couple of weeks ago, uh, the two verses came to mind from Proverbs, Proverbs 4, verses 18 and 19, that really, for me, describe what's going on in the culture today. Uh, the path of the righteous is like the first gleam of dawn, shining ever brighter till the full light of day. But the way of the wicked is like deep darkness. They do not know what makes them stumble. Um, and what that says to me is that when you're walking in the, in the dark, you, you don't see... As, as Stone Street was talking about, you don't see cause and effect. Mm. Uh, we, we, we just see people who are just like, well, I don't know what I'm doing wrong. Why, you know, life is unfair and, and people are not treating me well. Um, we have to come alongside them with compassion. Mm. And, and too many people who have rejected Christianity, who don't go to church, rejected Christ, um, feel judged. Mm. Um, and in my experience in ministry, and I've been leading various groups for a number of years, is that people have, people have to understand two things about you before they're going to listen to any kind of a spiritual conversation. They have to feel like you trust them, that they can trust you, and that you love them. Yeah. And if they don't feel like they can trust you, if they don't feel some kind of compassion or understanding from you, they're not going to listen to us. Uh, and so I think that's where it starts. So it doesn't start necessarily, although it can, with the preacher in the pulpit. Um, it, it starts with the, the connections of the people who are inviting somebody into a personal relationship or to attend church. But usually it's just a personal relationship. I, I mentor some, some men in our community, and I just came alongside one guy 
and was kind of having a business conversation with him. Not five minutes into the conversation, he asked me about my faith, my life, and stated that he needed some help. But he, we had already established a level of trust. But he was really, really struggling. I met with him the day for lunch, actually. And uh, three months later, he has come a long way because he, that we're trustworthy. Um, and in a world that Stone Street talks about of competing ideas and competing authorities, the, the ones that we listen to the most, whether they're in the media or, you know, political podcast or friends, what, the people that we listen to the most are going to be like what Paul talks about um, in 2 Timothy 4, is itching ears are going to want to listen to these people in great no, not just one. So we're, we're in an echo chamber. We hear the same thing over and over and over again. Mm. It's really hard to break through that if people feel like you don't love them or care about them. No, oh, and and Birga, he was just kind of setting up that whole conversation uh, that ties into the podcast that you're a part of on a weekly basis. There, curiosity, not judgment, as he talked about not not wanting to, for people to feel judged. And I, I listened in particular recently to your episode eighty one, and um, as you're talking about a world gone mad, and how do we find inspiration and hope in the midst of kind of the craziness? And uh, finding, as you mentioned, as you call it, our, our lighthouse, it gives us direction and purpose. Mm-hmm. And I would just love for you to just share a little bit of, of that context and, and where that conversation was, was headed with Gary and, and what you brought to the surface there. Sure. Thanks. Yeah, I, I think we've both been reflecting over the last number of years about the fact that we are increasingly exposed to just chaos And it may come in the form of, you know, financial instability at home within a business context. It may come in the form of health problems. It may come with wayward children. I mean, you can pick your, you know, pick from the litter, really, uh, of any of these topics that really can can throw you for a loop. And so we are always in that process of, of having to navigate through chaos. And so as we began to really unpack that, how do we begin to seek out you know, that lighthouse, how do we, how do we fix our eyes on that fixed point so that we can navigate correctly? Because if we're just being out there tossed in the storm, it's really easy to, to lose all sense of bearing. You can, you know, get turned the wrong way very quickly. And so, you know, as, as I, we're, as we're setting it up for our podcast, we use phrases that aren't necessarily inherently Christian, but I think those of you that come from a Christian worldview can understand the, yeah. the navigation that I'm pointing you towards. But yeah, certainly, I mean, we, we need that faith focal point in order to keep our eyes locked and to make sure that we don't get lost in the midst of all of the chaos around us. And that, and that ability for the craziness of life to honestly be the building blocks and the bridges to those conversations, right? I mean, to, to yeah. see that as the opportunity to say, mm-hmm. yeah, I'm there too. And I'm yeah. struggling too. And that that's, I'm not judging. I'm saying, Hey, I'm in a journey and a path. I'm on a path too. And I might Mm -hmm. come at it from a different perspective and have different sensibilities, different anchor points, different lighthouse. That's my guiding point, but yet I'm still in it with you too. I, I think the one, the one word of caution that I would throw in there is to be very aware of sympathy versus empathy. And what we want to make sure that as we're having conversation, especially with someone who may not initially share our faith or somebody that we're trying to express our faith to, is to not try to jump in there and say, oh, I know exactly what you're talking about. You know, your loss or your diagnosis is is exactly what I've experienced because it's it's never going to be the same thing. And so for us to come alongside with a a sense of compassion, a listening ear, being willing to just communicate in that manner where, hey, I'm gonna listen to you without inflicting my own judgment or my own, I don't know, uh, connection point to it, I think can go a long way in just having a atmosphere that is a little bit more open and that opportunity for somebody to to really hear your heart. Mm. As we're listening, you know, John Stone Street had talked about how ideas are smuggled into our culture through the definition of words. And as you were just describing, Birga, it takes that process of I'm willing to sit and listen. I'm not here mm-hmm. with judgment. I'm not here to 
to try to, yeah, just as you said, sympathize as if I understand, no, I'm here to listen. And I think that's so mm-hmm. true with what he was saying about the words and how do we, he, he said just that simple question, right, of what do you mean by that, you know, and that ability to maybe begin mm-hmm. to unpack and say, I'm not sure I have the same definition, but let me sit and listen and hear. So I'm curious, Tad, mm-hmm. like, have you been through that process or even as your group was, was discussing and dialogue, dialoguing on this a little bit, if that process of how do we really unpack definitions mm-hmm in a healthy way. In our culture, there are, whoever controls the definition controls the dialogue. Mm-hmm. Um, and it can be very difficult to come to an agreement on some of those terms. Yeah. So, you know, we have to sometimes come up with another word uh, mm-hmm. that would dis- descri- that would accurately reflect what we're talking about. T- typically, when people are talking in, in, in terms that are just radically different, um, we're not going to be able to reach them by trying to tell them our definition is correct. Someone here who's an elder at our church made a comment to me a couple of years ago. He says, I decided I wanted to change hearts, not minds. And, and that's too often what we try to do is we try to change minds. Um, and, and that's, that's just not the way it just doesn't work. Nobody, when I was lost in my twenties, um, nobody could change my mind. I, I did not want to hear what people had to say. You know, the only people I heard anything from were the people that were judging me. And um, of course, that was a long time ago. So we didn't have the problems that we have today. Uh, but the problems that we have today are so much different because he mentioned something about your truth versus God's truth. I believe that was in this podcast. Um and, and, and what we're doing is we're messing with people's version of uh, when we're trying to redefine words. So that's really a losing battle. Absolutely. You know, um, I think this is very similar to Tad to what you just said, but something that Gary has often said, you know, during the course of the podcast over the last 80 plus episodes is wis- wisdom is in the definition of terms. And so we have to really understand what people mean when they say certain things. But I think another key phrase is to listen to hear, don't listen to respond. And I think all too often we are in a very argumentative mode or we are wanting to convince somebody to adopt our viewpoint or to come and and match our way. And so we are listening with the purpose of responding and we're not really listening to hear. And I'm thinking back to something that Bonnie said, I think it was last episode or maybe two episodes ago here on this uh, Pathways to Purpose podcast. She said something akin to, we really have to love the person that we're trying to change. And that to me was such a powerful statement and I think fits perfectly into this narrative that if we are assuming we're gonna walk in and change a culture, change a person, change somebody's point of view, and we have no love for them, it's a lost cause from the get go. And if and when we can get to that point where we genuinely have a heart of compassion and love for that person, then the outcome looks vastly different for both that person and for ourselves. I was just listening to a conversation today um, where we were talking about most people don't really feel listened to. And then when you can genuinely listen to somebody to hear where they're coming from, to hear about their battles, about their struggles, about their beliefs, um, that's going to be a very unusual experience for them because most of us don't have somebody in our life. Now, I'm fortunate I do. I have a, a, a wonderful wife and I've got great Christian friends. But most people don't really have somebody who listens to them without judgment, without trying to tell them what to do, which men are very good at doing. Um, and and we can establish a, a connection with somebody much faster when they know that we're just listening to them to try to empathize. In that process of, of listening and, and building relationship that we don't actually have an agenda, right? Yeah. That it's not agenda driven. It's not so that I can get to a point of being able to tell you my truth, but that's just so critical to say, no, I, I'm, I'm willing to trust. I, I have such a big God <laughs> that I can trust that that God is going to handle the moment when that truth should can and should be delivered, but that I don't have to force that. And I can trust 
him in that process. Um, I know I have struggled with getting to a point to where I can be comfortable in that process of just <laughs> trusting that God's got it. Absolutely. It plays out in our marriages. It plays out in our parenting. And then, of course, it plays out in the greater context of what we're discussing. But, man, there's no one that's going to call you out faster than your kids if you go into a conversation with an agenda, right? If, you're, if your heart is to go in to listen and to respond appropriately to what they have said to you rather than going in with an agenda, vastly different outcome. And so, yeah, I think we have to we have to practice that everywhere we go. If if we are agenda bent, like if we have to accomplish a person uh, purpose with everybody that we're going to engage with, I think we're going to find ourselves disappointed and the person really disinterested in what we have to say. You reminded me of a conversation I had with my daughter Kelly. She was probably twelve or thirteen years old. She was uh, very frustrated with the situation. And in my natural dad mode, I tried to fix it. And she said, Dad, I don't want you to fix it. I just want you to listen. And she was very emphatic. That was a great lesson for me. Now, I haven't always remembered that, but that was a great lesson. How do we then correlate discernment with non-agenda driven conversation and yet still be discerning and and leverage that discernment in a wise way? And, And how do those correlate or do they? I think that's the whole deal with the Holy Spirit, right? I mean, that that is the Holy Spirit's MO is to, you know, speak to us live time to help us discern and help us to know how to process and respond. And so I don't think we have to have any kind of an agenda. If we've got that posture of, okay, Lord, your will, your way, I think it's going to turn out exactly as it's intended to. I I think that um, discernment is a way of God speaking to us um in a way that we can respond with a gentle question uh, you know the bible says to um explain things with with patience and gentleness uh, that's not exactly right uh, i'm forgetting the verse um but but to just probe and ask a question in a in a loving way just like what he said about definitions what do you mean what can you tell me more about that just those kinds of things that extend the conversation, that build trust, um, and and may or may not lead to us being able to uh, to share Christ. I think the only thing that I would tack on is just be very aware of tone of voice and expression when you're talking to people and having those follow up questions. So you know that that very important question that John posed of what do you mean by that when we're trying to get into the definition of terms. You know, there's a there's a vast difference between a harsh, what do you mean by that right. versus, well, what do you mean by that? You know, to, to sincerely be aware of how you're presenting yourself and making sure that your posture is one of receiving the information that the other party is going to provide rather than it be an attack question. And I think, you know, to your point, Ken, you said a little bit earlier about, you know, we're in an age of quick responses. We want we want to get down and dirty and get the business taken care of, but this can't be a quick transaction. We don't know how long the process is going to take to listen to somebody initially, let alone listen to them over a span of time that we can come to a place of, of like heart and mind over a particular issue. And so being very cognizant about how you're coming across, the posture that you take, the tone of voice, and even body language, you know, assuming that we're sitting together in the same room can be so impactful. And I I think we just all need to be aware of how we are coming across to another party as we're engaging in dialogue. So my thanks to Birga and Tad for their contribution to this podcast episode. We'll enjoy more conversation with Christian business leaders just like you on our next episode. So please be sure to let others know about the Pathway to Purpose podcast. And do check out FCCI.org and all the ways that the Fellowship of Companies for Christ can serve you. Until next time, may God encourage your journey as you lead a company for Christ. Mm -hmm.